Good morning, class. We are uh, looking at section 2.3, calculating limits using the limit laws. We have already covered the first section, the tangent and velocity problems. We went to section 2.2, the limits, the limit of a function. And now we're going to move on to calculating limits using the limit laws. All right. Uh, let's look at the synopsis of what we covered when we looked at the limits of a function. Uh, first, the definition of a limit, okay? The limit of f of x as x approaches a equals l. Simply put, it says when we get closer and closer to a from both sides, if we are approaching the same y-coordinate, we call that y-coordinate l, okay? So that's one thing. If you uh, look at the bottom, it gives us this idea by using the one-sided limits. Okay, class? Limits exist only if one-sided limits are identical. And on the right side, we have the equation of VA, vertical asymptotes, and definition of them. We've seen them before. What happens as long as X approaches some number from the left or right or both sides, and the function goes to, blows up to infinity or negative infinity. Finally, the graphs, what do they tell us? Um, they all have the same limit. Uh, however, what is the difference uh, and similarity? The similarity is that they have the same limit. However, the difference is the first one is continuous at x equals a, which means f of a is also equal to L. In part b, f of a is a different value, and in part c, it's not even defined. Okay, so having said that, let's start with the new stuff class. Okay, so let's put this in slide mode. and then move on. Okay, we've seen this stuff. So let's go to uh, new stuff, uh, very straightforward. The idea of a limit laws, and um, I will look at an example of that, is that basically if the limit of f of x approaches a and limit of g of x approaches a, a given, okay, then we can uh, use the, as long as they exist, okay then we can use any combination as we do the algebra of functions. That's really the bottom line. And when we get to that uh, particular function, we can replace it. However, what we are going to do, we are going to look at this concept known as direct substitution. I'm a big fan of that. I think it's very straightforward. You basically plug in and observe. That's all. You plug in and observe. Um, and you can do that, okay, when the function is a continuous function, by the way, okay. Uh, but every function we have studied in pre-calculus is considered a continuous function in its domain. And I can't emphasize this enough. Every function is considered a continuous function in its entire domain. So that's the thing you wanna be really careful of. In other words, if you're claiming a function is continuous, fine and dandy, show that you know the domain of the function. That's all there is to it. So, um, the next thing is just to remind you about the one-sided limit, everybody. The uh, one-sided limit tells us that <clears throat> as long as the limit from the left and right are identical. Okay, so this is from the right. This is from the left. As long as they are identical, then the limit exists. And we say the limit of f of x as x approaches a is l. Finally, we cover what's called the squeeze theorem. The squeeze theorem is very straightforward. If a function is in between two other functions, and we don't know anything about that function. However, the left side, the function on the left, f of x, 
it does have a limit. The function on the right, h of x, it does have a limit. Both of them, when x approach is a. So this one has a limit, this one has a limit, and the two are identical. Then the function in between must have a limit by squeeze three. All right. So that's the synopsis of the section. Let's move on, everybody. Warm-up example. I personally don't expect you to do it this way. However, you may have to practice for the sake of homework or even exam questions. So use the limit uh, properties to find the following limit. Uh, the limit laws uh, applies in the following manner. Okay, if you want to go with the limit laws, there are three terms here. So you cut them into three terms. And notice the limb sign sticks around, okay, and it doesn't go away. Okay. So that's the first thing. There are three terms, cut them into three pieces. Then the next one is x squared. We can write it as the limit of x as x approaches 4 square. The negative 3 for the second one can come out. And then we keep the last one. The limit law basically says when you get here, this is when you can replace it. So right now we replace the first one with four. The next one becomes negative three times four. And the limit law says if you have a constant, a number, then you just write the number. Okay, class? And when you add them up, you get them. However, as far as I'm concerned, okay, again, you've got to follow the homework and the exam the way want, they want you to do it before credit. As far as I'm concerned, I would simply plug in and observe. Simple, the answer becomes 11. So what I want you to see is um, the process is very straightforward. You go step by step and you see what happens. You plug in and you observe as the last resort, okay? Uh, let's move on. We want to evaluate the following limits. If they exist, we are looking at a uh, you know, graph of uh, different functions. Okay, we have the F function in red, the G function in blue. And we want to evaluate the limit of F of X plus five G of X as X approaches negative two, Never mind part B. So the very first thing is, uh, to realize how we can simplify this by using the limit laws, okay, and uh, taking them out, okay. But before we do that, let's look at each case, the limit of f of x <clears throat> as x approaches negative two, okay. So f is the red function. So in this branch and in this branch, I'm looking at, this is number negative two class, approaching negative two from both sides. As far as the red one is concerned, we are moving towards the hole. The hole has a y coordinate one. This hole has a y coordinate one. Okay, class. So this, this hole, okay, this hole has a y coordinate one. Now, as far as the g function is, the blue one, uh, approaching two from the left and right, okay, left and right, will get, will uh, give us this point, okay, this point class. And what is the coordinate of this point? The y coordinate, okay, negative. So first understand the limit of f of x as x approaches negative two and the limit of g of x as x approaches negative two. First we have this. Now, 
we simply replace where we must. So let's go with part A. Part A, we can take the limit and apply this to the f function five times g of x. Okay. And we take the five out. And now we can replace each one, okay, accordingly. And now this is the final answer. Okay, so I hope it's clear to everybody. All right. Now let's look at uh, number one. Okay, so when we are approaching number one for f, I hope you realize. Okay, let's just go with the highlight. Maybe it's easier. Now. So we are approaching uh, number one. Okay, from the left, from the right. And so that's where we are for f. Take a look at the f function, everybody. That's it, this is the y coordinate. And that y coordinate is simply two. When you are looking at the g function, okay, the left side, the left side brings us here. And the right side brings us here. So the left and right have different values. The limit doesn't exist. Okay. The limit doesn't exist because the limit from the left, from the left is here, negative two, and from the right is negative one. Okay. Therefore, part B, the answer is it does not exist. Okay. It does not exist. All right. So uh, one from the right, okay, one from the left. This is the explanation class that I uh, went over, okay. One of them has the answer, one of them doesn't. Okay, so one, what is the limit of f of x times g of x as x approaches one from the left and one from the right, they're not identical. You don't even have to go this route. There are two ways to approach it. You can approach it from a one-sided limit for the product also, okay? Um, again, previously what we did was good enough. You don't... Uh, have to go to the extra step. However, I hope you realize the meaning of this, the meaning of this, okay? This was discussed, okay? This was discussed class. You can see it from the graph, okay? And then look at this one. This is one-sided limit. This is one-sided limit, and each one exists, but the two are not identical, so that's fine. But what we did before is just as good. You don't have to go this route. In any event, how about the limit of f of x over g of x as x approaches two? Okay. Well, we have to find each one. So when x approaches two, okay, when x approaches two, I hope you see that By the way, the function is continuous at that point, and so the limit exists, and it's the y coordinate which is here. However, for the g function, it's zero, and you can divide by zero. So I hope you see why this doesn't exist, simply because the denominator, which is the limit of g of x as x approaches two, is approaching zero. So let me just quickly write that for you.
the limit of g of x as x approaches zero, as x approaches two, I'm sorry, is zero, that's one, okay? So the limit of the denominator is zero and we can't divide that, so that's one. Okay. I hope it is clear to everybody. All right, so this is using limit laws. We are going to move on. to the next example class. What you're looking at is the graph of the function absolute value of x over x. I hope you see if x is um, larger than zero, the top becomes x and x over x is one. If it's smaller, the top becomes negative x and the answer is negative one. We can't have zero simply because we can't divide by it. I hope everybody's clear on that. And so this limit doesn't exist. When x approaches zero, I hope you realize why, okay? Simply because the limit, if you look at this, first of all, this is the definition everybody can see. This is the same as this one. Now, the other thing that I want you to notice is that the limit, the limit of y, I'm gonna call it y, as x approaches zero from the left is negative. the limit of one as x approaches zero from the right is positive. Because they are identical, the limit of y as x approaches zero does not exist. Does not exist. The limit, the one-sided limits are not identical. That's the bottom line. Very straightforward, okay? The one-sided limits are not identical class. Okay. Okay. Let's look at more examples. What we are going to do, we're going to take the easy way out by simply plugging in and observing. So what I want to mention. I want to remind you what we do when it comes to the limits. I just want you to simply plug in class, okay? Just plug in and observe. So what happens when you plug in? So you plug in. When you plug in, you may get to a number. you're done. I'm repeating what we have gone over. This is extremely important. You may get zero over a number. That is equal to zero and you're done. You may get two number over a zero. All you have to figure out is it negative or positive infinity. Or you may get to cases such as zero over zero, infinity over infinity, infinity minus infinity. These are some forms known as, and there are more by the way, indeterminate. So in the case of an indeterminate, simply put, means more work, more algebraic techniques needed to fix the problem, okay? So I translated into, for me at least, more work, meaning I gotta figure out what K 
can fix the problem. Right. Part A is very simple, plug in and observe. When you plug in, the top becomes nine, the bottom becomes four, take it out of the radical becomes three halves. So part A, there's really not much to it. You plug in and you get three halves. It works out, everybody. Uh, professor? Yes. Question, sorry, what do you plug in? Plug in X equals two. Okay, okay, thank you. Because X is approaching two, am I right? Yes, that's correct. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, let's do part B. Let's plug in. Tell me what you get. Can anybody tell me what happens when we plug in? What do we get when we plug in? Replace the X with negative four. What do you get, class? Anyone? Say it again. Zero. No, if you get zero, you're done. Nicole, if you get zero, you're done. So what is the numerator? Let's put it this way. What is the numerator? Everybody, plug in. You can do the math. This is elementary. Plug in negative four. Can you tell me what you, what you get in the numerator? Zero. Zero. Very good. What do you get in the denominator? Can you add two numbers and tell me this is your calculus student? You plug it into the denominator. What do you get? Zero. Zero. So the answer is not zero. The answer is zero over zero. And what is zero over zero? Indeterminate, it requires more work, okay? And that's what I want you to see. Zero is not the same as zero over zero. Got it, thank you. Sure, and zero over zero means more work. I can't really emphasize that class. Therefore, what is the technique? You're looking at a complex fraction. You need to simplify a complex fraction. To simplify it, we're gonna multiply the top and the bottom by LCD, which is 4X. So we're gonna multiply everything by 4X. When we do that, notice what happens. We're gonna multiply this by one over four. We're gonna multiply this by one over X. And as far as the denominator goes, you just put it in the form of a product. And notice the limb sign continues. You don't lose the limb sign. X plus four drops and you get the limit of one over four X as X approaches negative four. Now you replace it and you get negative one over 60. So I can't emphasize this enough. Almost always almost always in calculus, we end up with some sort of a situation that is indeterminate and it requires more work class. I hope you realize what I'm saying. So we need to work hard to figure out how to fix the problem. That's the difference between calculus and pre-calculus. We do not get to a simple case. Uh, we get to a more complicated case. In part C, anytime you have a rational function, it's a good, or, or even a rational number, it's a good idea to simplify. And by the way, I hope you see that if you plug in, you get zero over zero. If you plug in, you get zero over zero. So what do you do? You simply do the factoring, that's all there is to it. And I'm hoping everybody is comfortable with factoring and everybody remembers A squared minus B squared is A plus B. Yes. Go ahead. Times A minus B. So this factors out in this manner. The X minus five is in common and it drops. 
Again, notice we are not losing the limit sign. Okay, everybody? We are not losing the limit sign. Now, when we replace the x with 5, we get 5 plus 5, which is 10 over 5, which is 2, and we lose the limit sign. So it's important to know when we lose it and why we lose it, okay? All right. We are just practicing with various types, so we're going to move on. Part A, again, the same thing. You can plug in, but anytime you have a rational expression, it's a better practice to simplify. Now, I'm going to give you a hint here. Number one, you plug in and you get 0 over 0. You can try. Whenever you get 0 over 0 class, one of the things that might help you uh, factor, because x is approaching 4, X is approaching four, everybody. Take a look, X is approaching four. You should have a factor of X minus four. If it was approaching 10, you should have a factor of X minus 10, most likely. But if it's approaching X, X is approaching minus four, that means it has a factor of X plus four, okay, class? So notice when we factor. I'm assuming everybody is comfortable with the factor, okay? For the top, top, you take the x out. For the bottom, you want two numbers. The product is negative four, okay? Which is the c, if you will, and the sum is negative three. Everybody remembers basic factor. So x minus four drops out. Right, everybody? And now you replace the x with 4, and you have the answer. So again, in most cases in calculus, we end up with a situation that requires a little bit of a work. I hope everybody understands what I'm saying. I really can't emphasize this enough, okay? And so that's what we do. Now, can anybody tell me in part B, when we plug in, replace the H with zero, what do we get? If we plug in, what do we get, everybody? We get zero? Again, uh, if we get zero, we are done. Do we get zero, class? No, we get zero over zero, so that's uh, indeterminate. Thank you so much, Joseph. Class, plug in. The top becomes zero. The bottom becomes zero. So you do not get zero. I can't emphasize this enough. Because if you do get zero, you're done. It's finished. You get zero over zero. Replace the H with zero, you get zero over zero. This is indeterminate. So what is the technique to take care of the business? You multiply by the conjugate of the numerator because it's in the form of a square root. And what is the conjugate? Everybody remembers a plus b times a minus b. We just went over that is a squared minus b squared. a plus b and a minus b are conjugate of each other. So all you have to do, change this negative sign to positive and it becomes a conjugate. However, you have to multiply the top and the bottom by the same thing because otherwise it's not acceptable. This fraction is equal to one and that is okay. Again, you can just multiply the top by it. Okay, you have to multiply both of them. And this is what we do. Okay, so having said that, what happens to this expression? You multiply the top and the top becomes 
the square root of 1 plus h a squared minus 1 or b squared the first part comes out and the second one becomes one by the way i want to make sure everybody understands that negative negative one squared is negative one which is different than negative one quantity squared which is positive one don't mix them up so notice what happens we can drop the one and negative one and what about the denominator do not do not distribute the h keep it why because remember h is approaching zero and the zero in the denominator gives us a hard time. We want to get rid of it somehow. Now notice we can factor out the H and get rid of it. From the top, it changes to one. From the bottom, simply goes away. Now, if you replace the H with zero, it gives you a number, one half. Okay, I hope it's straightforward. The technique is to multiply by the conjugate class. Multiply by the conjugate. Okay. All right, I think we are doing okay. What I want to do, I want to give everybody a moment. I'm going to pause the recording. By now, you probably have enough practice. I'm going to pause the recording, see if you can do this in a minute. All right. Um, by the way, anybody has the answer? What is, what happens when we plug in class? When we plug in negative four, what do we get? Zero over zero. Beautiful, beautiful. Therefore, we need more work to do. And the technique is the conjugate. So let's multiply by the conjugate and pay attention to the fact that this is equal to one, everybody. This is equal to one. And so when you multiply, the first portion, the square root comes out and then minus five squared. So the top class, the top becomes x squared plus nine minus five squared, which is nine minus 25, which is minus 16. Now, what I want you to pay attention again is that we do not touch the denominator at all. We don't. We just keep it intact as a product of two pieces. Remember, x is approaching negative 4, so that's a problem. What is a problem? x plus 4. So you're hoping the x plus 4 drops. You can see the numerator get factored out, and x plus 4 drops. and you write what is left. Now you are going to replace the x with negative four. So negative four minus four, the bottom becomes negative four quantity squared, which is 16 plus nine, which is 25 comes out as five. And this becomes minus eight over 10 and then it simplifies to negative 4 over 5 negative 4 over 5 okay class i hope it's straightforward So we've practiced a little bit, okay? And you need to practice a little bit more to get comfortable with this. Let us move on.
the concept of a squeeze theorem was explained, uh, okay? And I want you to even look at this graph that gives us the idea. The idea is that if there is a function in between, and we are just interested from to, from A to B, from some, in some, uh, you know, interval, it doesn't have to be everywhere. In that interval, and A is also in that interval, if the top one has a limit, the top in this case is H, if the bottom one is F, that means the left side of you. If they both have the same limit, when X approaches A, okay, then the one in between has the same limit. So the squeeze theorem or the sandwich theorem or the pinching theorem, okay, states that if g of x is squeezed between f and h near a, and if f and h have the same limit at a, then g is forced to have the same limit l at a. Okay. We want to look at a couple of simple, uh, uh, you know, examples involving the squeeze theory. So, Let's look at an example. We are looking at the first one, something very straightforward, okay? And remember what we have. We have the squeeze theorem saying, we are looking at part number 38, okay? Uh, that if the limit of the left and right are the same, the limit in between must also be the same. That's the idea behind it. I hope everybody is uh, comfortable with what I'm saying, okay? So this is known as the squeeze theorem, okay, class? And uh, let's look at the limit of the left side. The left side is 2x. The left side is 2x. So let's take a limit of that as x approaches 1. Clearly plug in and you get 2 times 1, which is 2. Very straightforward, very simple. You're done. The right side function, here's. Here's the function on the right. Let's take a limit of this guy when x approaches one. Simply plug in. It's really not a big deal. Now, because the function on the left and the function on the right have the same identical limit in the case where x approaches one, the limit of g of x as x approaches one must be the same by squeeze theorem. You have to mention the squeeze theorem class, okay? I can't emphasize this enough. Squeeze theorem must be mentioned, okay, class? All right. Now, let's take a look at something which is a little bit more interesting. It's different, okay, class? So we want to look at a question which is different. Uh, if you look at the next question, is asking to prove that the limit of square root of x times one plus sine squared two pi over x as x approaches zero from the right is zero. Something completely different, but it can be handled using the squeeze theorem. So the process of course is interesting and I want you to see that class, okay? So I wanna discuss the 
process. Now, the process is notice that sinusoidal functions are involved. Okay, so if sinusoidal functions are involved, what do we know about sine and cosine? We know that there is a limit. And by that we mean sine can only be between negative one and positive one. So regardless of the argument, this is called the argument of sine, cosine, okay. Regardless, it's of argument. The sine is between negative one and one. We know that. Sine of x or sine of two pi over x or anything else. So what we are going to do to use the squeeze theorem is to make the expression look like we want to get to this expression class. We want to get to this expression. Okay. So the very first thing we need sine squared. What happens if we square all three sides? Okay. By that I mean sine is between negative one and one. But about what about sine squared? Sine squared is between zero and one. Let me be clear. When I say square, that really applies to this guy and this guy, but not necessarily negative one, because if you square negative one, you also get positive one. But understand, sine is between negative one and one, but sine squared is only between zero and one. Okay? All right. Look at the brackets. Look at the brackets. What's missing? Number one, look at the brackets. Let's add one to all three sides. Add one to every side. So it looks like the inside of that bracket. What is missing? Square root of x. Let's multiply by square root of x, everybody. Let's multiply by square root of x. If we multiply by square root of x, all three sides, here's what we get. Square root of x, less than or equal to square root of x times the bracket, one plus sine squared two power x, and the right side is two square root of x. Now, take a look. This guy plus this one is identical to this one. They are identical. Very good. They are identical. Take a look. This one, identical to this one. Good. Let us use this square, the squeeze theorem. How? Take a limit of this guy as x approaches zero from the right, and this guy as x approaches zero from the right. Let's do that. As you can see, both of them become what? Zero. And because both of them are zero, then by squeeze theorem, the limit of the expression in between as x approaches zero from the right must also be zero. Okay? I hope it's straightforward. This is a question that you probably have to go over a couple of times to get comfortable with and be able to do a similar question like that. Whenever we have a sinusoidal function, sine or cosine are between negative one and one, always the value of sine, the value of cosine. So the squeeze theorem can be used. All right. Let's look at uh, the next example. 
uh, find the limit for this function. Notice the denominator is x plus six in an absolute value, okay? So this is really the function of interest. We can call this f of x or y. Okay, so you can either write the function and work with that, or you can approach it x, as x approaches negative six from the right and left and approach it that way. We can quickly look at both ways. So if we approach negative six from the left, okay, remember what happens. The absolute value of x plus six is x plus six if x is larger than minus six or equal. Uh, let me actually, sorry, let's just, I need a little bit more room. So absolute value of x plus six is x plus six, you can drop the absolute value if x is larger than or equal to minus six, and it's negative of that, otherwise. So when x is approaching negative six from the left, you get the negative portion, x plus six and x plus six cancel each other, you're looking at the limit of negative two, and that's your answer. Okay. Now, as x approaches negative six from the right, the absolute value simply comes out. Uh, obviously, we do the factoring and this ends up being two, uh, limit of two. As x approaches any number, the limit of any constant is itself. Therefore, the limit doesn't exist. Why is that? Because the one-sided limits are not identical. Okay. Um, this is the way to approach it. Um, another way that I can put up for you here, let me see what color I want to use. Let's, uh, let's use a green one. Uh, the um, f of x equals 2x plus 12 divided by the absolute value. This will be And let's just replace this. Ah, let's just add two times x plus six, two times x plus six over x plus six equals two if x is larger than or equal to negative six. Use a different color for the bottom, okay. Um, let me use a red one. And this is two times x plus six over minus x plus six, and it's equal to negative two if x is less than negative six. That's another way. Now, if you want, you can work with this function and do the limits. Either way, you end up with the same answer, okay? Um, there is one more page. I was gonna leave it for the students to uh, do it at home, but uh, 
just quickly let's do that to make sure we are comfortable with this since we have time let's look at the last page everybody okay We are taking the limit of the square root of x minus six plus three over x squared minus seven x plus 12. So basically, remember the first step, plug in. Just plug in. When you plug in, it just works out. Six minus six is zero, so the square root of zero is zero, so your denominator is three. The bottom is six squared, which is 36, minus seven times six, which is 42, plus 12. Do the math, you end up with one. You just plug in and it works out, end of the story. Okay? And so, what about part B? We've seen a similar question. In another page. I hope you realize if you plug in, you do get zero over zero class. And that's important to see. This gives you zero over zero. Okay. So plug in zero over zero. What's the technique? Whenever you have a complex fraction, you change it to a simple fraction by taking any methodology that you are familiar with. One method is taking the LCD, which is 3x. You multiply everything by 3x, the top as well as the bottom. When you do that, You multiply 3x by one third, you get x. You multiply it by negative one over x, you get minus three. And the bottom, you just write it as a product. You don't do anything. Remember what I said, because x is approaching three, if you have a zero in the denominator, you should somehow get rid of it, which means you have a factor of x minus three, and that's what happens. They cancel each other, we end up with one over three x. And notice, the limit sign, I can't emphasize this enough. The limit sign doesn't go away, everybody. The limit sign stays there until we replace the x. And this is your final answer. This is your final answer. I hope it's clear to everybody. Okay, it's very straightforward. And of course, it does require a little bit of a practice to get comfortable with this stuff, okay? Very straightforward. I have a question. Yes, of course. Uh, so on uh, part B of this example right here, uh, yes. how do you know what to multiply it by? Okay, first and foremost, Joseph, you're okay with the fact that we ended up with zero over zero, right? Yes. Okay. Then the next thing is you look at the fractions and you find the LCD. In the numerator, there are two fractions, agreed? The yes. fractions are, let me use a different color. The fractions are one third and one over X, Never mind minus one, but those are two fractions, right? And the denominator doesn't have any fractions. For those two fractions, what is the LCD? 3x. So you multiply the top and the bottom by 3x. This is the fastest way. Okay. If the denominator has fractions also, let's say you have two fractions at top, two fractions at the bottom. Then you have four fractions. You want the LCD for all four fractions and you multiply the top and the bottom by that LCD 
and your complex fraction will change to a simple fraction. Does that answer your question, Joseph? Yes, that answers my question. Thank you. My pleasure. Fantastic class. So this is it.